<coughs> okay, uh, we're a couple of minutes late, so I guess I'd better start. So I know you're going to be very sad that it's soon going to be the end of microbiology, right? <laughs> and you'll have to, at the end of the week, you'll have to throw away all your bacterial cultures and all of the agar plates that you'll see are really, really beautiful. I had a look on Saturday morning, so um, yeah, so we're going to quit bacteriology especially for me, these last two lectures are going to be virology. And so we have two lectures and basically the plan is going to be today is the introduction. And you know, what are viruses? How do you study viruses? And then some of the basics of virus structure and classification. You will be glad to learn the structural part is very, very simple, not like bacteria. And then an introduction to the virus replication cycle. So that's what we're going to do today. And then the next session, um, uh, have a look at a bit more detail in bacteriophage replication cycles the lytic cycle and uh, lysogeny. And then take a short look at how bacteriophages can impact human health. It might be quite surprising. You know, bacteriophages, these are viruses that infect bacteria. So how can they hurt us? Okay, because they can't infect our cells, these bacteriophages. Well, anyway, we'll find out that, in fact, they can have uh, both positive and negative impact on human health. And then to end up, we'll move on to human infections with kind of overview and then a couple of uh, short examples. But first, okay, what is a virus? And one of the main things you have to be clear about is what are the differences between viruses and cells? And so the, the kind of classical definition of a virus, going back to the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, is a virus is a filterable infectious agent, a filterable transmissible agent. So you've got some thing that causes illness in an animal or a plant, you can take the affected organ from that animal or from that plant, grind it up, pass it through a filter that will retain all bacteria, and the filtrate is still infectious. Okay, So if this were a bacterial infection, then of course all the infectious bacteria will be held back on the filter and the filtrate would be harmless. Okay? So in the, at the end of the 19th century, this was a kind of different type of transmissible infectious agent. And the definition is really based on the size of the infectious particle. Okay, So filterable, it means that the infectious particle is smaller than the pore size in the filters. So that was the kind of functional definition for microbiologists, let's say, about 100 years ago. And the first work in virology was on, you know, these filterable, transmissible agents. Now, the, so, you know, work was done over, you know, the 1930s and 1940s on viruses and infecting animals and, and, and infecting bacteria. And then in 1957, André Wolf in the Pasteur Institute tried to bring together everything that was known about viruses at that time and integrate it with, you know, the kind of what was what was new in nineteen in 1957 was the structure of DNA, right, and the nature of the genetic material. So uh, Levoff tried to integrate what was known about the 
the biochemistry and the molecular biology of viruses to try and give what at that time was called the modern definition of viruses. So here are the elements of a uh, Voss definition of a virus. So the, the infectious particle has a diameter less than 250 nanometers. And so this is going back to the same thing as the filterable infectious agent. Okay, the physical particle is smaller than a bacterium. The next observation about viruses is that they are obligatory intracellular parasites, and that is because they don't uh, possess any of the enzymatic machinery to produce energy or to synthesize proteins. That's why they are entirely dependent on the host cell. And one thing that Lvov had noticed was that when you get purified virus particles, and you extract the nucleic acid, you only find one type. You find DNA or RNA, but not both. And that was an unusual feature that really distinguished viruses from cells. And the last thing that was known at that time was that viruses do not replicate by binary division. So one thing that we can add now to this list, which was not known by the Wolf at the time, is another thing that really distinguishes viruses from all other types of all types of cells, bacteria or eukaryotes, is that no viral genome codes for ribosomal RNA. This is really a big thing because this is practically the most conserved molecule in the whole of the rest of the biosphere. So that's a, a fundamental difference between viruses and cells. Cells make their own proteins, and viruses exploit cells in order to make viral proteins. And this is something that was um, noticed by a, another microbiologist, a pasteur, Patrick Forter, who's still actively an active researcher. And he said that you know the whole history of life on planet Earth is a kind of three billion year struggle between replicators that have got ribosomes, that's cells, and replicators that don't have ribosomes. And they need to uh, infect and, paras and, uh, and parasitize cells. Okay, so this, for, for, for Patrick Forte, this is the, you know, the fundamental division in, in the biospheres cells and viruses. And then after that, you've got different types of cells. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do in the next few slides is pass through these elements of Lvov's definition and have a look to see to what extent they are always true and to what extent they can really distinguish all bacteria from all viruses or all cells from all viruses. Uh, this one I'm going to leave till the end because well, we have to see how viruses replicate in order to understand what this means. Okay. So if you look at the size of virus particles, at the time uh, Wolf was writing, probably the biggest known virus particle was this one, uh, smallpox virus. Okay. So the bar here is 200 nanometers. So you can see that the diameter of this virus particle is just about 250 nanometers. So it's, you know, knocking on the door here of the upper limit of uh, what, how you define a virus. Now, most viruses have particles that are smaller than this. Okay, so this is HIV. This is 100 nanometers, the bar here, so 100 nanometers diameter. And plenty of viruses that have diameters from, you know, 150 down to about 30 nanometers. So the smallest is going to be something like this with a diameter of about 18 nanometers. So that kind of fits. But, you know, once you start looking at exceptionally small bacteria, I mean, there are some bacterial cells 
that look a little bit like this. So I've tried to reproduce them for scales here. So this bar is 100 nanometers. So you can see that the diameter of this thing, this object, is less than 200 nanometers. Maybe it's about, I don't know, 600, 800 nanometers long. Maybe a little bit less than that. And just looking at the electron microscopy here, it doesn't seem like there's a structure on the inside is any more complex than what you have inside this object. However, this is a mycoplasma. It's a bacterial cell. So you can see that already, you know, just shortly after the Voss was writing here, there are already some kind of very small bacterial cells that are kind of at the limit, okay? So you have the biggest viruses about the same size as the smallest bacteria. However, what has changed this a lot is, has been the discovery over the last, I don't know, 15 or so years of these giant cytoplasmic DNA viruses. And the kind of record at the moment is held by the Pandora virus. So, you know, once again, this bar here, this is 200 nanometers. Okay, so you've got now this bar is 200 nanometers, so you know, we're looking at something, this is 600, micron, 600 nanometers across and easily, you know, like one micron in length. So you can easily see this by light microscopy, which is not the case for all of these viruses here. Smallpox particles, you can just about see them with a very good microscope. So currently, you know, this is a kind of the giant of the viral world, and it's bigger than plenty of bacterial cells. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, you have the, I try to find like practically the smallest virus particle with the simplest genome. And you find this in Circoviridae. So these particles have only got a diameter of 17 nanometers. The genome, very, very small. It's single-stranded circular DNA. So it's only like 1.8 or 1,800 nucleotides, basically. And these, well, these 1,800 nucleotides code for two genes. One is the protein that makes up the capsid. And one is for a protein that helps replicate the virus viral DNA. So this is the absolute minimum for any virus. One structural capsid protein and one protein required for replication. Okay, you can't get any smaller than this. So if you've got something like this, that circular DNA that can replicate itself inside a host cell but doesn't have a capsid, what would you call it? have them a lot in bacteria. <laughs> okay, let me just say this again. Okay, so you've got circular DNA that can replicate inside bacteria. It can be transferred from one bacterium to the next, but it doesn't have a capsid. What would you call that thing? Yeah, plasmid. Okay, so you know, replication is one part of what it means to be a virus, but the other part is really having a particle, having an infectious particle with a capsid protein, because this is what says viruses apart from, you know, other types of replicating nucleic acid, okay? So that's the absolute minimum for, you know, any virus. So in the genome of Pandora virus, look at the size of this thing, two and a half million base pairs here. Something like equivalent to maybe E. coli, the E. coli genome is something like this. There are several bacteria with genomes that are around about one megabase. So in terms of genomic complexity, this thing is more complex than some very simple bacteria. Now it codes for, you know, 
2,500 genes approximately. And when you look at the components in this particle, there's more than 100 proteins here. So it's a complicated structure. So, you know, just to, to show, just to show that in fact, you know, the biggest viruses are bigger than the smallest bacteria. So the different, the, the limit proposed by Levov, you know, there are some exceptions. Now, the other thing you should know about this is that there is no relationship between the complexity of the virus and the complexity of the host. So PCV2 is porcine circovirus 2, which infects pigs and causes problems in, uh, well, you know, in, uh, in farms. And Pandora virus and these other large cytoplasmic DNA viruses infect protists like amoeba, single-celled eukaryotes. So you have a really, really simple virus can infect and uh, cause illness in a complex host, and a really, really complex virus with a very simple host. OK, what's the next part of the Levov definition? Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. Well, that's true of all viruses, but it's also true of some bacteria. So Mycobacterium leprae that causes leprosy, Chlamydiae that cause, well, some of them cause uh, sexually transmitted diseases, Rickettsiae, uh, Rickettsia provozacchiae causes typhus. All these bacteria can only live can only grow inside a host cell. So you can't put some chlamydia into culture in LB medium or an enriched medium or plate them out on, an agar, uh, on a Petri dish. They can't grow. They need host cells. So this is a good explanation of how viruses replicate, but it's not enough to distinguish viruses from all bacteria. So viruses are dependent on their host cell because they don't have any enzymes to generate metabolic energy or to synthesize proteins. So, oh, I better check this actually. Because uh, okay, intracellular bacteria, most of them will generate their own ATP. Oh, okay. Okay, better, we better check this, all right? I, I know it's on the slide here, but um, I'm not, we better check before the end of the lecture, we need to correct whether this is chlamydia or rickettsia, because one of these two doesn't synthesize its own ATP. It has a symport antiport system. It will export ADP and import ATP. So it's kind of like the mitochondria, except in reverse. So this one does not synthesize its own ATP. However, you know, all these intracellular bacteria produce, synthesize their own proteins, their own membranes, their own, their own cell walls. Whereas, you know, for viruses, ATP and proteins are synthesized by the host cell. Now, the other thing that Levoff noticed was that unlike cells, Virus particles generally only contain one type of nucleic acid. So every type of cell, eukaryote, bacterial, even dormant bacterial endospores, contain two types of nucleic acid, a genome made of DNA and three types of RNA, ribosomal messenger and transfer RNA. Now when you look inside purified virus particles, which you can see here, one electron microscopy. Sometimes the genome is double-stranded DNA. Sometimes it's single-stranded DNA. Sometimes it's RNA. So the genetic material in viruses is more variable than what you find in cells. OK, so here we can see you know, some nice images of purified 
virus particles. So how do we actually get to this? How do we how do we get this kind of image? And the general the more general question is how do we study viruses? And there's a, there's two real problems here. One of them is that they're too small to 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 see directly. You know, in the lab classes you all had a look at the bacteria in the culture, you just have to put them under the microscope and you can see these things, right? Well, viruses, they're too small to see by optical microscopy. The only, and the other problem is that they only replicate inside other organisms. So you can't get them to grow in culture medium. So you can't get them in pure culture. Okay? So there's really kind of two approaches to studying viruses. One of them is to the kind of like biochemical, physical characterization of the virus particle. And here the idea is we want to produce the virus somehow then purify it. Once we've got it in the pure form, we can analyze what it's made of and, and look at its structure. Okay? So you can get you know, something like this once you can purify the virus. Now that's going to tell you about the characteristics of the virus particle, but it's not going to tell you very much about how the virus replicates. So to do that, what you have to do, oh, why is it doing this? It's being really annoying. Okay, let's try that again. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So now the okay, for this part, okay, if you want to understand how viruses replicate, what you've got to do is look at them together with the host cell or the host organism, set up some kind of experimental infection, and then find out what virus proteins are expressed and what virus genes are expressed by, you know, Western blot, for example, or, you know, quantitative PCR to find out what virus genes are expressed. So the kind of experiment you would do is okay, we got a virus And we sequence this gene. We know that it's got like four genes here, right? A, B, C, and D. And we want to have an idea about what they're going to do. So what you do is, what you might do, is get your virus. And at time zero, you will infect a cell culture, for example. And then different time points, you'll take samples. And then in these samples, you'll analyze uh, which one of these genes is being expressed, where the proteins are expressed in the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, this kind of stuff, and how many copies of the genome do I have over time? And if you do this, you build up a picture of, you know, how the virus uh, replicates inside the cell. But to do this, you've got to have the first part. You've got to start with a purified infectious virus to start doing this. So the basis of all of the, you know, virology is really amplifying viruses, growing viruses, and purifying them. And then you can do a bunch of interesting stuff. So in terms of production systems for viruses, really there are two types of system for producing viruses. Firstly, whole organisms. So this is what you know, Pasteur had to do for uh, his production of the rabies virus. He had to inoculate uh, one rabbit brain with another infected rabbit brain. And this all was also how the study of plant viruses started. So tobacco mosaic virus was first, you know, um, cultured just by getting you know, bits of an infected leaf and inoculating them into another plant. 
So that was good. I mean, that, that was the, the, f the, f the first steps in virology really relied on systems like this. They might seem a little bit old fashioned, but there are still some uh, veterinary vaccines that are produced like this. You know, you get the virus, you inoculate it into an animal, it gets sick and dies, replicates in the liver a lot, so you take out the liver, mash it up, inactivate it with formal, and that's your vaccine for use in animals, not in humans. So, you know, there's still some uses for this kind of uh, system. But you can't really get detailed information about, about how the virus is replicating when you have like a whole organism. It's too complicated. So you need a simpler model system. And the first one, of course, was you know, bacteria that could be easily cultured. So you can use bacteria to study the replication of viruses that infect bacteria, bacteriophages. So you know, most of the fundamental work in virology was started out by studying bacteriophages. And that's because there was no really uh, amenable cell culture system available until the end of the 1940s. So from this time point on, 1950s, 1960s, there was really a lot of uh, you know, really major advances in, my, in virology with several Nobel Prizes, a lot of new viruses discovered by culturing viruses on cells. Okay, so you've got some kind of a production system. You can amplify up your virus by putting it into an animal or plant or a cell culture dish. So after a while, the virus is going to produce lots of copies of itself and it will kill the cells. And you're going to start with a big mess full of cell debris, viruses, and maybe solula soluble proteins hanging around. What you want to do is get purified viruses. So the first step is often filtration. So viruses are filterable agents, so they pass through the filter. All the cell debris gets retained. And the next step is going to be ultracentrifugation over a density gradient. So you can make up these gradients of you know, sucrose, cesium chloride, or a chemical compound called iodixanol or optiprep. And basically the idea is you start out with your mixture of virus particles and soluble protein, and you layer it on the top of a gradient. So down here you've got a very high cesium chloride concentration. Up here, a low cesium chloride concentration. So here you'll have a density of about, I don't know, 1.3, 1.4 gram per ml. And up here, it's going to be close to water, so 1 gram per ml. So you put this in the ultracentrifuge, spin it overnight, come back in the morning, and what has happened is that the virus particles will sediment through the gradient, but they'll be concentrated where the density of the virus particle is equal to the density of the, you know, the solution that makes up the gradient. So they can't you know, pell it all the way down. Now if this works, you should have something nice and visible like this, and you get a kind of um, band in the gradient. Okay, so th th this is me here. Okay, and so these are uh, Proteomavirus particles that have been labeled with a fl fluorescent marker. So that's why we can see them. And if you look closely, actually, there's two bands in here, okay? And what I think this is, is this is empty virus particles, and this has some kind of DNA inside. So that's why they're denser, okay? It's the same size of the particle, but it's also got DNA inside, so it's denser. So what you can do is you can harvest this band, and that's it. You've got your purified virus particles. And once you have that, then you can look at them by electron microscopy to see the structure of the virus particle. 
and then you know analyze them by you know biochemically or physically so here we have you know SDS page and you can separate the different proteins that are in these particles so this is these are pox virus particles complex virus and you know you've got you know, I know dozens of different proteins in here so this is a complex example here this one you have like three capsid proteins in here so whenever you see something in a virology or a microbiology textbook says okay we've got this virus it's got so many proteins the major caps the major part of the protein is this one it's got this one that's how we know okay somebody has purified these virus particles and put them on an SDS page gel so we know everything that's inside the virus okay so basic structure of virus particles now another word for the virus particle is a virion and the basic difference is between naked or non-enveloped virus particles which are composed of nucleic acid in the middle surrounded by a protein capsid and on the other hand there are enveloped virus particles which have a nuclear capsid inside surrounded by a lipid membrane which is called the envelope now, naked virus particles, it have two types of morphology, you know, uh, rod-shaped particles, which have a helical symmetry, and spherical particles, which have icosahedral symmetry. And in bacteriophage, or at least uh, you know, the <coughs> tailed phages, you have these two elements that are put together so they've got an icosahedral head and a helical tail now among enveloped viruses what you call a simple enveloped virus has got a nuclear capsid which has either helical or icosahedral symmetry which is surrounded by this lipid envelope okay so this is an example you know with a helical nucleocapsid and, uh, and an envelope. So complex virus particles, they've got membranes, but on the inside you can't really see either of these two simple structures. So, you know, Pandora virus, pox viruses, these big membrane bound viruses are, have complex structure. So as soon as people could get their hands on an electron microscope and start looking at purified preparations of viruses they began to start you know classifying different viruses according to their morphology in electron microscopy so there are several virus families that were uh, were defined based on their morphology so arena viruses right okay it's not two guys running around with uh, swords trying to kill each other it's because arena what does this mean sand right sand so arena viruses have a sandy kind of uh, uh, look on, in, inside them on the electron microscopy coronaviruses the glycoproteins form a kind of crown around the virus particle Kilisi viruses is a kind of like cup shape on the outside of the capsid. So these morphological characteristics define are shared by all the viruses in these families. Okay. So the two basic now what we need to do now is understand the two basic types of capsid structure. So helical and icosahedral symmetry. Now the basic primordial function of the capsid is to protect the virus nucleic acid. Okay, so it's okay inside the affected cell if the new virus nucleic acid is is free. Okay, but you know once the virus has got to be transmitted from one cell to another or to go from one host to another, it's going to be outside. Okay. So outside in the air or stuck on a bench or something, nucleic acid doesn't really last that long. 
inside your blood, okay? You've got RNAs, DNA is one in the, in the plasma. Free nucleic acid gets degraded by enzymes. So the basic function of the capsid protein is to protect the genome from chemical or enzymatic attack. Now, the kind of concept behind helical symmetry is that, okay, we've got nucleic acid, it's a linear molecule. And what we can do to protect this linear molecule is just cover it with a kind of spiral of capsid protein. So I'm kind of drawing this as a line, but what this is, is, you know, hundreds and hundreds of copies of the capsid protein that add on to each other from, you know, each one of these, each copy of this capsid protein is one step in a spiral staircase that goes up and up and up, okay? And it winds around the nucleic acid, and that's it. You've covered the whole of your nucleic acid. It's protected. So that's what you have in tobacco mosaic virus, and quite a lot of uh, naked helical plant viruses. So the capsid protein on its own will form this double disc structure, and then when it interacts with the viral nucleic acid, which is RNA, one of these two rings is going to be kind of pushed out of alignment. And this gives you a free face on the protein, so another monomer can polymerize here, can be added on. But you still have a free face, and you get more and more copies added on until, you know, all the virus RNA has been covered. Very simple. You get a capsid pr produced with hundreds or a couple of thousand copies of the same capsid protein. Now, the problem with this is that it places a limit on the size of the genome because as the genome gets longer, that means the particle, the virus particle, has got to get longer as well. Now, if you look at this, this is something like, it's very, very narrow here. This might be, I don't know, 15 nanometers diameter. And then the, this is pretty long. And if it's becoming too long, it loses stability physically. You know, this thing can snap in half. So this is a, a real limitation. Uh, if viruses have this kind of captured structure, they're kind of trapped evolutionarily. They can never develop a more complex genome by adding more genes because the capsid is going to be too unstable. Now the other type of virus capsid are viruses with or are capsids with icosahedral symmetry. So the idea here is that you know nucleic acid is a linear molecule, but we can actually just, you know, crumple this up in three dimensions into a kind of ball, like a ball of wool. And then this DNA can be surrounded by a protein shell. So that's the idea here. So the capsid proteins are going to form a hollow sphere, and the DNA or the RNA of the virus goes on the inside. And this is much more efficient in terms of packaging up DNA or RNA molecules in a small, compact structure that is going to be stable. Okay. Now, the simplest way to do this is if you have 60 copies of the same protein. So three copies make up one triangular face, and 20 of these triangles make an icosahedron. So that's why it's called icosahedral symmetry. Now, the viruses with this kind of structure, you know, they're pretty small. You can only make a capsid 20 to 30 nanometers in diameter. And if you want a larger capsid, then you have to add more proteins in and the architecture becomes more complex. But you can still kind of visualize these particles as having 20 triangular faces. So that's why, you know, all of these capsids have icosahedral symmetry. Now, 
envelope viruses, simple envelope viruses. So what do they have? In the middle, they've got a nucleocapsid, so nucleic acid and protein in the middle. And on the outside, they have the envelope. Ah, this is a good point for me to remember something I forgot to say about capsid, uh, capsid function. So and the main function of the capsid protein is to protect the virus nucleic acid. Second function in naked viruses is the capsid proteins have to mediate the attachment to the host cell. Okay, so this thing here, this is a picornavirus capsid, like uh, poliomyelitis or common cold or hepatitis A. And the attachment to the host cell is mediated by uh, this kind of uh, association between VP1, 2, and 3. So this is where it's going to be binding to the host cell. Now in envelope viruses, the capsid proteins are inside the envelope, right? So they don't have any contact with what is outside of the virus particle. But these viruses still need to bind to a host cell and they still need to enter into a host cell. So they need something else to do this. And that's the function of the enveloped glycoprotein. So every enveloped virus has also got to have enveloped glycoproteins in order to attach to the correct cell and to you know, gain entry into the right cell. So enveloped viruses, they've got nucleocapsid, and they also have to have enveloped glycoproteins. Many of them have <laughs> some kind of proteins in between the capsid and the envelope which are either called matrix or, well, matrix or tegument proteins. Okay. Um, so matrix proteins, their function is often, they often help in the formation of the virus particle, and they have a structural role, just maintaining a rigid contact between the nuclear capsid and the envelope. Uh, tegument proteins, so this is a herpes virus here, Tegument proteins have a, have, have a different function, which I'll just take a minute to explain to you. So this is the cell, right? This is a cell that's going to be infected. Okay, so this is the cell that's going to be infected. And this is our kind of herpes virus, which is going to infect the cell. Now, the first thing that's going to happen here is that the viral envelope is going to fuse with the cell plasma membrane. And the role of these tegument proteins is that they can immediately gain access to the host cell cytoplasm and start to, you know, screw around with whatever the cell is doing and help the virus to replicate. Okay, so that's the role of the tegument proteins in herpes viruses, is to you know, immediately start to undermine the, the host cell. Okay, you don't really need to know that, okay? You just need to know matrix, where is it? Matrix proteins, tegument proteins, where are they in the structure of the virus? Okay, so those are the basic elements of virus structure. Now, classification. Uh, now just like in the rest of microbiology and the rest of biology, Virologists want to have a systematic classification. And the, the committee that does this is the ICTV, which whenever, okay, so whenever, so if, if you ever discover a virus, okay, you'll isolate your virus, sequence its genome, 
and send the characteristics to the ICTV. And you'll say, I have, I've discovered a, a new virus. It has never been seen before in the whole the history of microbiology. But the ICTV, their job is to say, oh, well, maybe this is just a new member of such and such a family. Oh, sorry, it's not so new. Or, or maybe it is absolutely new, in which case you'll get a whole new virus family just for you. So the, the, the objective here is to try and classify all the known, vi all known viruses into some kind of phylogenetic classification. Now, there are some kind of interesting differences between viral classification and you know, classification of mammals or bacteria, for example. So one of them is that not all hierarchic levels are represented. You know, so in the Linnaean classification, you know, you've got like the kingdom, phylum, class, this kind of stuff. So in viruses, we only go up to the order level. Okay, so there's no such thing as class or no kingdom of viruses. Uh, so, for example, human respiratory syncytial virus, part of the genus of human virus, which is subfamily pneumovirinae, paramitsa virus, one of the mononega virali. So, you know, the ending of the word here is telling you about the taxonomical level. Okay, so this ALE goes to order just for the same as, you know, other organisms. But for family, virus families end with viridae, subfamilies end with virinae, and genus names are something virus, but all in one word. So pneumovirus is a genus. And species names are something, 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 virus, but here, two words. So this is a species level denomination. Okay, so a little bit technical, but that, that's the way it is. And it can only go up to order. So the other thing that is, oh, it's still in French. I'm so sorry about that. The other thing is that, uh, you know, not all viruses can be forced into this hierarchy. So what do I mean by that? Well, there are, 25 virus families that are currently grouped into seven different orders. But there are 71 virus families that aren't grouped together into orders at all. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, that means that there is no common universal ancestor of all viruses. Unlike, you know, cells. So, you know, these 71 different virus families and these seven different orders, maybe they represent, you know, different, distinct, independent origins of viruses. So that probably means, you know, over the course of evolution, different virus families have emerged independently several different times. Okay, so another classification scheme, which is very widely used and very, very useful, is the Baltimore classification of viruses. So this was David Baltimore at the end of the 1960s proposed that, you know, we should stop trying to look at electron micrographs and see which viruses look like each other, but we should think in terms of molecular biology. What is the nature of the virus genome and how do viruses manage to replicate their genome? So it started off by saying, okay, we should dist distinguish between DNA viruses and RNA viruses. And DNA viruses, you can see that there are some viruses with a double-stranded DNA genome. So this is class one of the Baltimore classification. Some DNA viruses have a single-strand DNA genome. This is class two. And then with the RNA viruses, he started to do the same thing. So class three are double-stranded RNA viruses. But for single-stranded RNA viruses, he proposed two different classes. Firstly, plus-strand RNA viruses, class four, then the negative-strand RNA viruses. So what does this mean? In plus-strand RNA viruses, 
the RNA genome codes directly for a protein. Kind of looks like mRNA, okay? Whereas in negative strand RNA viruses, the RNA doesn't code for, 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 for directly for protein. It's got to be transcribed into a plus strand, and these are messenger RNAs. Maybe I should draw this out because, okay, so if we've got a negative strand RNA virus, what you do is you generally represent them going from 3 prime to 5 prime like this because the virus is going to produce different <coughs> mRNAs. And these can be translated into protein. So that's a negative strand virus. So a positive strand virus, the genome already looks like this. And can be directly translated into protein. So just technically, even you know, it, now now we can sequence everything and in uh, millions of copies. But way back in 1970, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing had not been invented. So how could you tell the difference here? Okay, what you could do is get a purified virus preparation. <coughs> extract the nucleic acid, find out whether it's single-stranded DNA or RNA. And then for the, for the single-stranded RNA, you can transfect it into cells. If you've got a plus-strand virus, just the RNA on its own can start the infection. If you have a negative-strand virus, that won't work. Okay, so there's a kind of experimental way to determine this. So one of the things that's important about this is that you think, okay, how can these, how can a virus do this? It's got a, it's got a negative strand genome, and it's got to produce messenger RNAs. So this virus has got to have an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Because no cellular R polym polymerases will do this. RNA polymerase in the cell uses DNA as a template, right? And not only that, but these viruses have to carry this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase inside the capsid, inside the particle. Because it's got to be present inside the cell straight away so that it can produce these mRNAs. Okay, so th this is why the Baltimore classification is useful, because it makes you think of all the things that need to happen for the virus to express its genes. And the way this is going to happen is going to be different depending on the Baltimore class. Okay? So initially, when Baltimore pr proposed this, then uh, that was it. He thought, you know, we've got the five classes, that's it. That's all the possible situations. However, there was kind of a surprise with the discovery of retroviruses. So these viruses have an RNA genome in the particle, but replicate via a DNA intermediate in the host cell. And there are also, the kind of inverse of that, called class 7, viruses that have DNA in the particle, but replicate via an RNA intermediate in the host. And often, these two classes are grouped together as uh, retro-transcribing viruses because at some point, both of these types of viruses have got to copy RNA into DNA with a reverse transcriptase. So this, the discovery of these viruses was, you know, it was a Nobel Prize uh, observation because it violated uh, the fundamental dogma of molecular biology, which is information gets stored in DNA, transcribed into RNA, and then translated into protein. So you've got the direction of information flow, DNA, RNA, protein. So here, you've got the opposite. You've got RNA, or information going from RNA into DNA. So this was a big thing and, and won the Nobel Prize for David Baltimore and Howard Teeming. Okay, so other things that 
can be used to you know, classify viruses according to their genome, whether it's circular, linear, whether you have a single molecule or a segmented genome. Okay, so how are we doing? So that's <coughs> going a bit too slow, to be honest. Right, so <coughs> just to give us all a little bit of a break here, I think what I want you to do is uh, concentrate on one, two, three. They should be pretty obvious, but we're a bit stuck for time. So I would just like you to think about question four and question five here, okay? Okay, so question four, okay. Everybody ready to go with this one? So naked viruses are more resistant to detergents than envelope viruses. Who says yes? Who says no? Whoa, most people say no. No, why do you say no? Anybody who said no, why? Okay, so they've got like an extra layer. Okay, so somebody who said uh, for yes, why yes? Yeah, you're kind of on the right track. So you got the right answer for the wrong reason by the sound of things. So, yeah, but the key word here is detergent, right? So this envelope is a lipid, you know, it's a lipid bilayer. Detergents disperse lipids. So if you treat an envelope virus with soap or detergent, washing up liquid, this will be dispersed. And the glycoproteins here will just disappear as well. Okay, but these are necessary for the virus to remain infectious. This might still survive on the inside. It might still be intact, but it won't be infectious anymore. Whereas the naked viruses here, okay, they don't care. They can, uh, you know, they don't have any lipid component to wash away, and they remain infectious. So in fact, the answer to four is this is true, and it's very important because it determines what kind of prevention measures are going to be effective against different types of viruses. It's much easier to inactivate envelope viruses just by simple hand washing or, you know, washing a surface down with a, you know, good detergent. And that will not be effective against most naked viruses. So you need you know, different types of control measures and different protocols for cleaning surfaces and preventing transmission. So number five, viruses are not living organisms. Okay, so who, let, let's forget the, the not here because we'll get a double negative. Viruses are, are, they are alive. Who said they're alive? No, who says viruses are not alive? Uh, most people, who says something in between? Yeah, I'll go with something in between because it's kind of difficult. They're not entirely inert, but I, I, I agree they're not really alive. Yeah, I'd go for that. Yeah, right, so we've got about 15 minutes here to think about the virus replication cycle. And this goes back to the observation by André Lvoff that 
viruses don't replicate by binary division. So if you think about all types of cells, you start off with one cell, gets a bit bigger, and then pretty soon it will divide into two cells. So this is true for bacteria, it's true for us, ever since we started dividing from the state of a fertilized egg. You know, we all started off like this, right? It's, it's scary when you think about it, isn't it? So, uh, you know, if the same thing happened to viruses, you could imagine you've got a virus particle, somehow it's going to get a bit bigger, and then, from time, and then eventually these two virus particles are going to separate. And in fact, that's not true. Viruses do not replicate like this at all. And that's what uh, Lvov's observation means. And this is a real fundamental difference between cellular division and virus replication. And people started to, to notice this when the first experiments on viral growth were performed way back in the 1930s. Okay, so this is Edison Delbrook. And what they were trying to do was to analyze the growth curve for virus. You know, like for bacteria, you inoculate them into a medium, you count them at the CFU per ml at different time points, and you get the different phases of the bacterial growth curve. So the idea here is to do the same thing with viruses. So you get preparation of purified bacteriophages and use them to infect a culture of bacteria. And then at different time points, you sample the culture of infected bacteria and you tighter the number of infectious phage with a plaque assay. And these are some of the results they published from like 80 years ago. You get these curves like that. So plaque assay, what is that? You know, so when you're in the lab and you wanted to count the number of viable bacteria, you made up the dilution series and then spread them out on an agar plate. And so one colony represented one CFU, one viable bacteria. So the idea is we want to do the same thing for bacteriophage. But these phage, they can't grow on an agar plate. What do they eat? They eat bacteria, right? Bacteriophage. So you've got to plate them together with uninfected bacteria. So the idea is that each of these dilutions is going to be mixed with bacteria and soft agar. So you set them up, put them into culture, and then what you get is something like this, where you've got no infectious bacteriophage. All the bacteria grow all over the place. Where you've got a lot of phage, all the bacteria are killed and lies. And at some point, you'll have something like this with like little holes in the bacterial lawn. So this is a plaque where the bacteria have been lysed. So what you do is you count up these plaques and you say, okay, I've got 8.3 times 10 to the 5 PFU per ml. That's how, that's how this test works. But what exactly is a PFU? Okay. What does a plaque actually represent? So, try and go through this quickly. Because, you know, if you've got a purified stock of bacteriophages, each one of these plaques represents one infectious phage, okay? Just like one colony on an agar plate reflects one viable bacterium. But in the experiment here, you don't just have purified bacteriophage. You've got a mixture of infected cells and free phage. So that's the problem here. What does a PFU represent? So you've got a mixture of infected bacteria and free phage. How many plaques is this going to give you? And in fact, <coughs> depending on which one of these is true, you'll get a different number. Okay? So, just think for a couple of minutes about how many do you get under condition one, under condition two, and under condition three? 
and then which of these numbers is the right one? Okay, so if one is correct, how many plaques do we get here? Nobody knows? Four, yes, okay. So if one is correct, each one of these gives us one, this gives us zero. Okay, if two is correct, how many plaques do you get? Eight, yeah, okay, four here and four there. And if three is correct, how many do we get? Okay, I'll give you, it's not four and it's not eight. But it is in between those two numbers. <laughs> it's not the average. It's five, okay, one, two, three, four, and then this one, the infected bacterium, is just going to give one plaque. Okay, so why does this happen? We've got this situation here, okay? We're putting this in, in a mixture with non-infected bacteria. So, you know, this one is just going to fall down here. It's going to be here. And these phage are going to infect new cells, new bacteria somewhere. And we cover this with agar. So that means when this bacterium is killed and it explodes, it liberates bacteriophage, they can't diffuse very far. They just infect the cells nearby. So that's just going to give one plaque. And each one of these phage up here is also going to give one plaque. Okay? So Bearing this in mind, so now we get to the interpretation of the experiment. Okay, so the Delbruck and Ellis experiments showed that this is very reproducible finding for men, well, yeah, for, for different bacteriophages, and it's true for all kinds of viruses as well. Once you in, start your infection at time zero, you observe a latent phase where the number of plaque forming units per ml is the same, is identical, doesn't grow. And then you get a very, very rapid release phase where the number of PFU per ml goes up very, very fast, and then you get a plateau. So the interpretation here is, uh, okay, what is happening is we first put, you know, we start the infection, the phage gets into the bacteria, and then initially down here, we've got the phage, it's replicating inside the bacterium, but the numbers don't go up because this just gives us one plaque. And then when this bacterium explodes and it liberates all these phage, and that's why the, the kinetics are so rapid. So this can be like 10 minutes and you'll have the titer goes up by a factor of 50 or 100 or more. So it's very, very, very fast. Okay? So this is the model that you get out of this type of experiment. And how do you test the model? What you really want to do is to be able to measure the number of phage that there are inside the bacteria. And this can be done. It's possible to do this because these experiments were done in gram-negative bacteria in E. coli. Okay, so the outer membrane is sensitive to detergents, is sensitive to organic solvents, whereas the bacteriophage are naked, non-enveloped viruses. So they resist the detergent or the, uh, or the solvent. So you can lyse the bacteria with chloroform and recover the infectious particles that are inside the bacteria. Okay, so you do the experiment again. Oh, I thought I had. And what you get is there are two curves. Okay? So the dotted line is what we saw before. 
and in the solid line, this is what you get if you use chloroform to lyse the infected bacteria. And the big surprise is that at early time points after infection, you get zero, you get nothing. Okay, and this is called the eclipse phase. And what that means is that directly after entry, the bacteria phase disappears. The virus doesn't exist anymore. The, you have an infected cell, but it doesn't contain any infectious viruses. And then later on, when this line starts to come up here, this is where you've got plenty of new bacteriophages inside the cell, and then they're released. So this is the big surprise here, the eclipse phase. Early after infection, you don't really have, a, a, the virus doesn't exist. Now these steps can be visualized by electron microscopy. So this is, I'm going to show you, it's not a bacteriophage, it's a large DNA virus that infects chlorella, unicellular algae. And so you can see the virus here, this is attaching to the surface of the cell, then it's going to enter. And in fact, what you can see is that the capsid stays on the outside, and it's just the DNA that goes inside the cell. That's why there's no more infectious virus, because an infectious virus is the capsid plus the nucleic acid. And once you've had this step, there's no more virus. You can't see any viruses inside the infected cell. This is the eclipse phase. Later on, you can start to see new viruses formed inside the infected cell. They accumulate, and finally, finally they get released by lysis of the infected cell here. So these, these are the fundamental steps in the virus lytic replication cycle. Every virus does this. Bacteria, it's true for bacteriophages, it's true for HIV, it's true for every human or plant virus. So the first step, attachment. Virus has got to fix onto the right host cell. Second step, entry. There's no point hanging around on the outside. The virus has got to get into the cytosol or the host nucleus. Third step, decapsidation. The genome has got to get out of the capsid somehow. Now, entry and decapsidation can sometimes happen at the same time. It's what we saw just now for the chlorella virus, but it's not necessarily always at the same time. They're not necessarily simultaneous, so that's why there are two distinct steps. So once the genome has been released, then two things need to happen. The virus has got to express virus proteins, and it's got to replicate the genome. So during the eclipse phase, this is what's happening. Okay. Now once this has occurred, you have you know, maybe hundreds or thousands of viral genome copies in the infected cells, and probably thousands of copies or tens of thousands of copies of viral proteins. And they just get assembled like uh, building a Lego model inside the infected cell. So these you produce new viruses, and then they are released. Okay? So that's it. That's how viruses replicate. So the things that you have to remember about this is that the fundamental difference between virus replication and cell division is that during the eclipse phase, the virus doesn't exist anymore. Okay, during cell division, you always have at least one cell, right? You don't have the cell disappearing and then reforming somewhere else. It doesn't work like that. But that's how viruses replicate. Uh, how does the plaque assay work? And the stages of the replication cycle. Attachment, entry, decapsidation, gene expression, genome replication, assembly, release. Now, if you want to, so the practical application of this is if you want to develop an antiviral molecule, you need to block one of these steps. Because for the virus to replicate, it's got to go through every one of these steps, right? So if you can block one, that's it. You can block virus replication. If you can block two or three, then you'll have you know, a combined antiviral therapy with different classes of antiviral molecules 
and it would be very difficult for viruses to become resistant to these, these therapies. Okay? So understanding how viruses replicate is, has been an essential step in developing antiviral therapies. So I guess we're out of time. And I see you, we see each other when? <coughs> Wednesday. Okay, yeah, so Wednesday for the last lesson. And that will be the final scores of Microbe of the Week on Wednesday. No more questions. Okay, yeah, but when is our last class? Thursday, yeah, yeah. Th Thursday after at the end of the afternoon, right? <laughs> okay. Yep, that's it.